okay. Um, it's Belisi and Lenny. Belisi is going to move into the picture a little bit more. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, now we're going to talk seriously about uh, the second class of Greek verbs. All the lessons up to now from unit 1 to 11 have been about the so-called regular verbs, um, which is the living class of verbs. There actually are some living classes of verbs that are athematic, but the major um, uh, uh, athematic verbs are archaic. Okay, it's a system that no longer functions. It's just in the same way as in English, we have the we have two classes of verbs. We have we have the the so-called um, um, strong verbs like eat and ate, mm. or or bring and brought. Okay, which have weird old patterns of of vowel change and stem change that no longer function for new words. Right. And then we have, and but they're in very common words, okay, like bring and eat, okay, mm -hmm. um, or the verb to be is the worst example. I am, you are, he is. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't have any other words that function in that way in right. the singular change and totally. So the there are the strong verbs, and then there are all the others which work in a very much more regular way. So in Greek, there are, there are the athematic verbs, and basically there are four of them, okay. Um, the We'll talk about what they are and and uh, later on, um, but but they're such common words and they have so many uh, compounds. Okay, okay, that it's impossible to practically read a Greek sentence without knowing them. Okay, true. They're ubiquitous in Greek. So um, get, getting a grasp on and here our stress is going to be not on generating these forms because we're not learning how to speak Greek, mm -hmm. but on recognizing them when they see them. Um, we, we're going to teach you. All the forms of the of the um, uh, of the this of these verbs, except for the uh, um, participles, okay, in uh, at once, okay, because it's a system, and once you understand the principles of it, you can figure it out. All right. So here's here's the way we're approaching it. We're going to start with a list of the things that are different between these verbs and the ones that you know, okay. Mm -hmm. And the first difference is that they're, they're called as a class the athematic verbs, and that's because they have no thematic vowel separating the stem from the ending. And that's literally and historically true, okay? Um, you do have the fact that when you come to the subjunctive, remember the subjunctive? In the subjunctive, what you have is an alternation between eta and omega, and that's a doubled thematic vowel. The older subjunctive where you might form the subjunctive, and we still have texts that attest to this, was to introduce a thematic vowel, mm. okay, um, in an athematic verb. So the, way, the distinction between, between indicative and subjunctive was indicative had no thematic vowel, subjunctive did. So in the athematic verbs, that's still the rule, okay? There is no thematic vowel in the, in the indicatives. Uh, in the subjunctive, you have a doubled one because mm -hmm. that didn't become the norm, okay? Right. It used to be uh, not eta and omega, but epsilon and omicron, okay? Mm. But so, so in that way, they're like the regular verbs, and a lot of the features of the athematic verbs are starting to be approximated to the, the regular verbs. In fact, by the time you get to New Testament Greek, they're just contract verbs, okay? So they're on their way out, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but but um, it's a beautiful system. In some ways, it's just a, it, it's a more, a much more precise system than the regular verbs, okay? And I think we can see how it really, if we understand how it works, we can do, we can make it easy. Okay, and even beautiful. So um, that's the first feature. We don't have an E or O vowel alternation between a, a verbal stem and its ending. Okay. Okay. So they, they, you do have the A and the omega in the subjunctive, but no no E or O vowels between stems and endings. Okay. And this even applies to to middle middle forms, which makes them extremely easy because you don't get the kind of contraction and stuff like that that makes second person singular and middles and the regular verbs a nightmare. Okay, that's one one important thing and we'll, we'll explore this in detail. These are we're just giving you the big picture at this point. Uh, there are several personal endings in the athematic verbs that are older and that you haven't seen before. Some of them you have, okay. Um, in the we're, we're dividing them up here between the primary endings and the secondary endings. That is the primary endings are those that are used for um, verbs that are not augmented, indicatives that are not augmented, and the secondary are verb endings are those for those that are augmented. In the primary verbs, you have some some things that are weird. We've already seen me as a first person singular ending, but in the optative, right? Luoi me. 
Um, but here it's an indicative ending for the first person singular. So, um, and, and here's something that's even more weird, that we have a third person singular ending in si. This is confusing, okay, because we're used to seeing usi as a third person plural. But in the athematic verbs, the contrast of the third person singular is between those verbs that end in si, which is singular, and those verbs that end in asi, which is the third person plural ending. We've never seen that before. So these are brand new personal endings that we have not experienced. Um, finally, uh, in the secondary endings, there's only one. They're the ones that we're used to, nu, sigma, nothing, men, te. But the third person plural ending is distinct from the first person singular ending, as it is not in the regular verbs. Remember, it's nu, nu in both of them. In the athematic verbs, there was a difference, and the third person plural ending uh, for the for athematic verbs, for past tenses, like for the imperfect, is san, okay? So that's it for weird personal endings, okay? We've got no thematic vowel. We have a handful of personal endings that are different. Um, there is also one more thing that we could add here, and that is that in general, the infinitive ending in the athematic verbs is nigh, and nu, alpha, uh, iota, okay? Add that on. We've seen some examples of that too. We've seen nigh as the perfect infinitive ending, but it's the generalizable uh, infinitive ending in the athematic verbs. All right, so now we'll move on to the to two more, the other two features that distinguish this other class of verbs from the regular ones. And here's this something is weird, and what, until we show you an example, it may be hard to grasp what we're talking about. But in the athematic verbs, the you, you have a, a, this, the, all this, the athematic verbs have a vowel in the stem, and it can be either long or short. And there's also in some of them an intermediate stage, a, a diphthong form. So, for example, you can have a verb whose stem vowel is an eta that can alternate with an alpha, or a stem vowel that's an om, omega and it can alternate with an omicron, or it can also alternate with an omicron upsilon. Okay, mm. so there is that, it's the same verb, okay, and the alternation in the stem vowel is a matter of, you have one in the singular and the other in the plural, or you'll have one in the first uh, person and another one in the second and third person, okay. Um, this is this is something we're not used to, okay. Um, it makes memorizing these verb forms a pain in the butt, okay, mm -hmm. but we're not interested in memorizing these things. We want to be able to recognize them. So the main thing for us here is we got to be aware that stem vowels will change in length, okay, between a long vowel and a short, eta and epsilon, eta and alpha, omicron and omega, and also sometimes um, eta and you get epsilon iota uh, or omicron and omicron upsilon, okay. Well, we don't, we're just not going to worry about them, okay. We just have to realize that it's the same verb and it doesn't really affect the most important features of the, of the verb. There are other features that are distinctive that compensate for our not paying attention to them. So we have nothing to lose by ignoring them. We've got to learn to ignore them. <laughs> okay? All right? Ignore. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the last thing, and this is, the, this is the real key to understanding these, is that the principal parts of these verbs are really built around the aspect structure. Okay. And, and, and we're going to take one minute to explain how this works. Okay. And here's the way it works. In the aorist of these verbs, the stem is, is simple. Okay. So example, let's give this an example. The, the verb to give, okay, which is the simplest example. In the heiress, the stem is da or do, okay, okay, do, let's do heiress, okay, da or do, so, so put a, a oh, label heiress over, oh, okay, right. okay, so that's the simplest form, okay. In the imperfective aspect, the stem is dido or dido, okay? That is, you have a reduplication, but a reduplication with an iota, okay? Dido or dido, okay? You're also going to see didu, but we're not worrying about those things, okay? And then in the perfective aspect, you have what you would expect, which is reduplication with an e, okay? Which is dedo and dedo, okay? 
Okay. Sorry, it's so smushed in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what differentiates the three aspects is the aorist has no reduplication. The imperfective aspect has reduplication with an I. You can remember that. That's a, the I for imperfective and the I for the reduplication. Okay. And the perfective aspect has what you already know. That is reduplication with an E. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these verbs all begin. The three, the four, uh, there are four uh, athematic verbs. Uh, we're going to learn three of them because the fourth one is very similar to the third one. Okay. So we're going to learn these three. And this is what characterizes them all, okay, in terms of their forms. And this is what we need to do to be able to recognize any one of them that we see. All right. Cool. I'll stop there.